Today we are going to preach under the title, What's Your Greatest Goal? What's your greatest goal? Hallelujah. Praises to the name of God. Here we find a very common passage, and we find Moses, a man. We know that he was chosen by God with a specific purpose, which was to take the people of Israel out of Egypt. It was not an easy task. It was something very demanding for him. And that's why Moses is concerned, because Moses knew that without the presence of God, it would be impossible to take out these people, amen, from Egypt. And that's why here we find uh, Moses presenting that request before the Lord. And he says in verse 14, in verse 15, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. It's very important that statement that Moses said, because we as people of God, despite we know that God has chosen us, despite we know that we have a specific goal given by God in his work, we need to understand that despite we are chosen, we cannot do anything without the presence of God. And that is something we tend to forget. We tend to forget that because many times when we have to do something for the Lord, we forget that we are depending on Him. We forget that we need to seek Him. We forget that without Him, things can be very bad. Hallelujah. So Moses had that clear. He really understood that the source of that power, the source of that blessing, the success of that task given by God was that the presence of God was with him. Hallelujah. So people today have many desires. People today have many goals they would like to achieve. And that is not bad. That is necessary for all of us because a life without goals, a life without those desires is a monotonous life. That's why many people commit suicide, amen? Many people uh, kill themselves because they lose their goals, because they don't have a motivation to live in their lives. So goals, desires are necessary. But we as Christian people must understand and must have clear what is our greatest goal. Because the goals of Christian people cannot be the same goals people without the Lord. People that haven't known Christ. Amen. We have been transformed. Our hearts have been changed. And we need to think like God thinks to desire as God desires, amen, and to do as God wants us to do. Glory to the name of Jesus. The Apostle Paul was some, uh, somebody that also had very clear his, his goal in life. If we go to Philippians chapter 3, we find the Apostle Paul speaking about his goals in, in his life. Philippians chapter 3, glory to the name of Jesus, verses 13 and 14. The apostle said, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark. And in the new version, the new King James version says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The apostle Paul really had an encounter with God. He was transformed by the power of God. He was a sinner. He was a persecutor. He hated the church. He hated believers. He hated God. But when he had an encounter with the Lord, his desires, his goals were transformed. And now we see the apostle saying that he had forgotten those things that were before, that were in the past. 
it means what I wanted before, now I don't want. Now I want something else, which is the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that is something we need to learn and we need to have clear. But also, the apostle had like a polemic in his life. The apostle really had clear that he longed for the presence of the Lord. However, he also understood that there was a plan that had to be carried out here on earth. And if we go to Philippians 1, chapter 21, it says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But, uh, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I would not. For I am in a straight bed with two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So he was hard pressed between two things. He wanted to depart to be with Christ because he was his, it was his final goal to be with Christ. And he said that it was better for him to be with Christ. However, he understood that he needed to remain in the flesh. He needed to remain here on earth because that was needful because of the work of God. But he understood that the final goal was not here on earth. That the final goal was to reach the presence of God. Glory to God. So, if we study the life of this apostle, we find that he was rejected after he became a Christian. Even by the same apostles. The apostles rejected at the beginning the apostle Paul because they didn't believe that he was really a converted person. He was falsely accused, he was stoned, he was imprisoned, but he never fainted. He never dismayed. Even he was in jail, and while he was in jail, he was not complaining against God. He was not blaming other people because he was in jail. He was so filled with the presence of God that he was worshiping him, that he was praising the Lord. So we indeed notice that for the apostle, the presence of God was the source of his power. That he could persevere doing the work of God because he was filled with the power of God, with the presence of the Lord. And that's why he was able, despite so many hardships, despite so many persecutions, despite so many trials, he was able to make it till the end. Glory to the name of God. We can also see an opposite example. If we go back to the Old Testament, we find Saul. Saul was a man anointed by God to be the first king of Israel. He was chosen, he was anointed by the Lord, but on the contrary than the Apostle Paul, he forgot the source of his power. He forgot the source of his blessing. And he went far away from the Lord. If we go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, glory to God, 1 Samuel chapter 15, hallelujah. In verse 10, the word of God says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried unto the Lord all night. We know that Saul had been chosen by God. He was given some tasks, some commands, but Saul failed. Why? Because he didn't obey the word of the Lord. He didn't do according to the commandment of God. And this man forgot 
that all what he had to do was pleasing God with everything he had, with everything he did. Amen. So Saul didn't obey the command of the Lord. If we read verses from verse 17 to 19, it says, And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointing thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Disobedience. Here we see that when we start to disobey God, we are making a big mistake and we can be cast away from the presence of the Lord. Disobedience brings also separation from God. And we need to have this clear because sometimes people think that having the presence of God is just a matter of saying with your lips that God is with you. But my dear brother and sister, my friend, it's not just about a saying. The presence of God indeed needs to be with you for you to be successful in your Christian life. And if we disobey the Lord, we can be rejected from the Lord. So how can we say God is with me when I am disobeying him, when I am rejecting his word, when I am rejecting his commandments? But after this man committed the sin, he didn't accept his fault. Because at the beginning, when he was rebuked by Samuel, he started to justify himself. Let's go to chapter, to verse 20. Because here we find Samuel rebuking him because of his disobedience. And in verse 20, Saul said unto Samuel, Yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. So Samuel was saying, you disobeyed. And he was saying, no, I didn't disobey. I obeyed. I did as the Lord told me. He said, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. 21. But the people took of the spoil, sheep, and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Hallelujah. So when we understand and when we say that the presence of the Lord is our goal, that that is what we are seeking after, it is demonstrated with our actions and we become obedient people. You know that Saul finally acknowledged his sin, but he was more concerned for what people would say about him than for the presence of God. Let's read verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. So finally, he accepted his fault. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And if we read verse 30, Samuel is still insisting. And he says, then he said, I have sinned. Yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. So we find that this man was not really concerned because of the presence of the Lord. He now acknowledged his sin, but he is concerned because he doesn't want other people to realize that he made a mistake. His main concern is, oh, I honor me before the people. 
He was not sad. He was not sorrowful. He was not painful because he had sinned against the Lord. He was worried because, oh, what people would say about me. And sometimes that happens to us. Sometimes we disobey the voice of God. Sometimes we don't please the Lord with our actions. Sometimes we even do the opposite. But since people haven't noticed our mistake, our sin, our fault, we say, okay, we are fine, we are okay. And it's not so. Because every people, everyone, all people around you can think that you are upright with God. But if in your heart you are not so, the presence of the Lord can be far away from you. And how come you are going to reach to heaven without the presence of the Lord? How come we are going to be successful in our Christian life? How come we are going to make it till the end? How we are going to make it to heaven without the presence of God? Hallelujah. But we see a different case also. Not everyone did wrong before the Lord. And I would like to quote David. David was also a king. He was, his heart was according to the things God was looking for in a king. But he also committed a serious sin. He committed adultery and he killed a man to hide his sin. He didn't acknowledge his sin at the beginning either. He remained quiet. He said, nobody noticed my sin. Everything is hidden. So let's continue like that. But then the Lord who knows everything, praise him. Then the Lord sent the prophet to confront David's sin. And David was face to face with the prophet. And after the prophet told David, you are that man, you committed adultery, you killed that man. Then he acknowledged and he said, if we go to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 12, we find that passage I'm speaking about. 2 Samuel 12, 13. Hallelujah. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Here we find the mercy of the Lord. We saw that in Saul's case, Saul said to the prophet, pardon me. He was speaking to the prophet. Saul was not speaking to God. Saul was not asking for mercy to the Lord. He was asking the prophet, he was asking the man, pardon me, go with me, go with me to worship the Lord. But he never surrendered to the Lord. He never bowed down before the presence of God to say, oh God, I don't want your spirit to depart from me. But in David, we see that there was a difference. And it was that David immediately acknowledged his sin against God. And it is in this moment when the scholars say that we get Psalm 51. Let's go there. Because in Psalm 51, we find the prayer of David when he repented of that serious sin. And it is a beautiful chapter because we find here how the repentance of a man can reach the Lord. Amen. So in, first, in the first verse, David said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. We see here the attitude of a man that really had sorrow in his heart because he knew that he had sinned against the Lord. 
He didn't pretend to hide, to continue hiding his sin. But many people today, they are rebuked. They are confronted with the word of God. Even there are other people sent by the Lord to confront them with their sin. And they say, no, like Saul. No, I didn't do that. Me? Are you sure? When you, you and I know that we have sinned. Why? Because many times we worry more. We are more concerned for what people say. And we are not concerned for what God says. For what God thinks about us. Glory to the name of Jesus. So, if we go to... I would like to read all the chapter, but we don't have much time. Let's go to verse 10. David says, create in me a clean heart. So after he acknowledged his, his sin, he is asking the Lord, restore me. I am dirty. I am unclean. And he says, create in me a clean heart of God and renew a right spirit within me. And I love verse 11 because it says, Cast me not away from thy presence and take no thy Holy Spirit from me. David understood that if he continued with his sin, if he continued with his transgression, if he continued doing evil, the presence of the Lord would depart from him. And that should be our concern, my brother and sister. If we don't commit sin, it's not because I want to please my pastor or because I want to please my brethren or because I want to have a position in church. If I don't commit sin, it's because I know that my priority is the presence of God, the Holy Spirit of the Lord. Why many times the presence of God doesn't move in our churches? Because we don't acknowledge our sin. Because we know that we have been doing evil and we are not able to repent before the Lord. The presence of God is fleeing from our churches. No, because God is not the same. Because God is the same in the past, in the present and in the future forever and evermore. The problem is not God. The problem is ourselves because we don't repent. We, know, we don't acknowledge our sin. And the Lord is merciful. Every time we come to God with a condition like David, acknowledging the sin and telling God, God, I am unclean. I've been defiled, Lord. I've been failing you, but I want you to cleanse me. I want you to purify me. The Lord will do it. And then we will feel the presence of God. We speak so much about the presence of God. We shout a lot about the presence of God. But we indeed don't have the presence of God in our hearts, in our lives. That should be our goal, my brother and sister. That should be our greatest goal here on earth and in our eternal desires. Because sometimes people think that the presence of God is only when we die, after we die. And it's not so. It's not so because we are no part of the kingdom of darkness. We are part of the kingdom of God. And as we are part of the kingdom of God, we have the promise that we can enjoy His presence. And when the presence of God is in a place, when the presence of God is in a person... We are filled with joy, with peace. All things as the apostle are nothing, are like garbage. We don't care so much for the material things when we have the presence of the Lord. But our greatest desire is to have communion with him. That's why we come to church. That's why we serve the Lord. Because our greatest desire is the presence of God. Nothing, nothing can be compatible with the presence of God. No matter how many earthly things we have. 
No matter if you have a nice car, a nice house, a nice family, if you don't have the presence of the Lord, you will continue feeling sad. You will be feeling like life doesn't make sense for you. But when you have the presence of God, even you cannot, you, you don't have a pair of shoes, you don't have enough clothes, you don't have a car, you don't have a house, but you are happy because the presence of God is pressing you towards the final goal, which is reaching to heaven. So today, what is our goal? What is our priority? Is indeed the presence of God? Because if our priority, if our goal is the presence of God, like David, we should repent of our sin. Because we know that light doesn't have communion with darkness. God doesn't dwell in a temple full of sin. God is holy, 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 three times holy. And if we really want the presence of God, not just words, but indeed the presence of God in our lives, we need to sanctify ourselves in the blood of Jesus. We need to come to him and to ask him, like David asked, create in me a clean heart and cast not away thy Holy Spirit from me.